Hello and welcome to The Print. With rapid developments in the field of artificial intelligence, there have been growing concerns about its ethical implications and potential risk to the society. A lot of experts have also called for pausing the developments in AI to develop a framework which can regulate it. I am Yutika Bhargav and today we have with us Maria Grazia Spicherini, Director of Social Policies at the Social and Human Sciences Sector of UNESCO. To, we will discuss with her today the complex world of AI ethics and explore ethical considerations surrounding the development and use of artificial intelligence. Welcome, Maria. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. To start with, what are the ethical considerations in AI? What are the things that we need to see? So, um, AI, to start with, let me, let me put forward something that we are living but people perhaps are not very much aware of. And this is that AI is with us everywhere. Hmm. It's a technology that some call like general purpose technology, which means nothing less than it is everywhere. So it's changing the way we live, the change we, the way we interact with each other, the way we work, and the way we do anything. And this is why it is important that a technology that is so pervasive Hmm. like AI, really respects human rights and human dignity. That is, it is ethical. Hmm. This is what at UNESCO we intend something to be ethical. It's really about being centered on human beings and respect human rights and human dignity. And what are the concerns? Imagine, for instance, that by the time uh, you want to, say, purchase an health insurance, the AI system that is analyzing the data in the back actually says that you might be very expensive or predicts, for instance, that you might be facing, because of the data they have accumulated about you and the mm -hmm. analysis that the AI system has been doing in the back about you, tell you that you're not worth, you might be too costly for that. So it has first of all the magnitude consequences on all our lives and also the basic needs we might have, yeah. like having access to credit or not, being discriminated or not. I mean, we have seen in the past that there have been a number of algorithms that were selecting always men for a job because it was based on the data that existed, the algorithm were building on the data that existed and the data that existed, especially about some occupations, were mainly about men. Hmm. So automatically the system was suggesting to hire yet another man. And of course, this translates into women not having an opportunity to get a job or a get a good job. And there are a number of other issues that relate to the use of AI as a decision support mechanism. And the fact of being or not being ethical, what are the concerns is about being included or excluded. It's about being considered and being given a solution, for instance, also in health, hmm or not being given it, being provided with information that is biased, with fake news, and being convinced about something that might or might not be real, or that is a very polarized or very partial view of the world on which you are embedded, or excluding you for some social connections, or a number of opportunities, it's really about being part of the, the, the world or yeah. being excluded for it. Because at the end of the day, the other thing that we are seeing in this world, the digital world, is penetrating more and more the, let's call it analog world. Yeah. So the real world is getting intertwined more and more with each other. So it's very important. And these are the concerns that we have in terms of ethics. Yeah. That if this all new world that is a mixture of digital, analog, and virtual is not ethical, there are going to be very serious consequences for those that are left outside or that can be actually damaged by it. So do you think ethics should be at the core of uh, technological development as far as AI is concerned? Absolutely, yes. I mean, to me and to UNESCO, that is a no-brainer. Mm. Any technology, any development technology, and UNESCO has been working now for some years mm. on different technologies. So UNESCO was the pioneer in putting the discussion on the genome mm. and the recommendation on the genome. We also have a declaration on climate change. Mm. So the technological revolution, what typically the, the researchers call the new technological paradigms, change people's lives, for good or bad. If you don't have an ethical approach to it, of course, things can go very, very wrong. Mm. And what I think it's a misunderstanding generally in the debate we are seeing about responsible ethical AI is that ethical is not anything philosophical. It's very applied. 
It means every time you do something with this algorithm, think that it's going to impact on some persons in some way, shape or form. Mm. And so whatever comes out has to respect human rights and human dignity. And responsible might not be enough. It's a good first step forward, but it's not enough because responsible means, for instance, comply with the rules that mm. exist in some countries. But those rules are the optimal. For instance, in some countries, you might have kids working. In others, you don't. Hmm. People of different age or different conditions. So do you really think it's good just to abide by those rules that you perhaps are not even sufficient in your country because you're doing something in another country? So we really call, and UNESCO calls very vividly, for the ethics of AI. And ethics that are by design. That is, the problem with AI is that... It is so pervasive mm. that we cannot do what we have done with other technologies before. That is, let technology develop, then by the time we see the results, if there are problems, we are going to fix it. With AI, it's so pervasive that it might be too late for that. It might not be sufficient and it might be even impossible from a practical point of view to adjust and to fix the pieces. And that's why UNESCO calls for ethical by design, that is, let's build Let's start using it. Let's start deploying AI in a way that is fundamentally respectful mm. of human rights and human dignity. Uh, UNESCO also has a recommendation on ethics of AI, which it has asked its member states to adopt. Uh, can you talk a little bit about those recommendations and how they would uh, help in bringing equality? Absolutely. Yeah. UNESCO was so proud to see its member countries, 193 member states, so we are really talking about the whole world, yeah. they came together in the context of the, first, the 41st um, General Conference to say we adopt the recommendation. The recommendation is this, um, this paper you see here. And this a text that was elaborated after two years of intense discussion, also supported by the world leading experts on the topic, representing all the parts of the world, because it was really an inclusive design. What it says, it is about, so the recommendation puts forward uh, some key values, like the ones I was describing, hmm. and the principles. But then it wasn't sufficient. So as you might know, before the recommendation of UNESCO, there had been some other institutions, also governments, that had been working about putting forward principles. Now, what the recommendation does is that it builds on them all, evidently building as the core point, the starting point is the human rights, and develops them further also in a concrete way. Because the problem we saw about a number of other exercises that existed out there was the, um, the breadth and the depth, yes, but also the possibility to, to get real. So um, what the recommendation has is clearly denoted 11 areas for policy action, which range from data to privacy to health to educational skills to um, the environment and gender, just to name a few. And actually, we were particularly proud not only to have the provision. So for instance, the recommendation puts forward, and countries agree to that, to the to a principle of fixing problems if they occur hmm. and repay. This is non-existent in any other recommendation. That is, by the time AI creates problem, first of all, there always has to be someone that is responsible for it. So we cannot leave responsibility to algorithms hmm. because they're not people and you have to have human oversight always. Hmm. But in addition, if a problem emerges, you have to stop and you have to compensate for the problem that exists. So it's not that because it's a technology, you can hide as we at times see like, oh, the computer doesn't allow me to do that. No, this doesn't happen. So countries have to put in place legislation, regulation, actions that actually allow to enforce this kind of mechanism. Another thing that we are particularly proud of, of this recommendation, for instance, is that it bans things like uh, mass surveillance. So countries agreed to ban mechanism and to put into force action to avoid mass yeah. surveillance or social scoring, for instance, which are things that are very, very dangerous in terms of the human rights, right, that needs to be respected. The other thing that the, the recommendation puts forward very, very clearly is the need to A, use AI for sustainability purposes, and at the same time, to check what mm. are the impact of technologies like AI in terms of sustainability. So the energy consumption, the use of the materials. So you have to have a development and a use that is actually environmentally wise. And another thing that was 
really coming through the inclusion, inclusive approach of the recommendation that says very clearly, uh, puts forward very clearly, for instance, principle of non-discrimination, inclusion of, uh, for instance, uh, categories that are not well represented, yeah. people with disability, was a focus on gender. So by the time we started the discussion, that was mainstreamed, but then our assistant director general, Gabriela Ramos, came to UNESCO and she, she has always been a very big defendant of the gender cause. And so she actually had countries agree on a full chapter on gender to put it very clear that empowering women, empowering people of different genders, A, does good to the technology, but the technology has to be very carefully developed, deployed and used with respect for and having everybody at the center. So there is also this aspect of the inclusivity that is spelled out yeah. in a very concrete way for some of the problems of our world that we know, unfortunately, very well, <laughs> as for instance, because women are not really part of this game yet. If you talk about uh, issues of sustainability and inclusivity, especially in context of a developing country like India, uh, what do you think are the potential benefits that a technology can, a technology like AI can have and the potential risk that may be unique to a nation like India? So the, the benefits are huge. Hmm. So are the challenges. But the challenges can be compensated. So first of all, AI being a pervasive technology, it's a, a one of its kind in the sense that compared to other technologies that have been booming in the past, think about biotechnologies, the infrastructure you need is relatively less costly. Hmm. There is one component that India is very wealthy of, and is human capital. You need brain, you need people able to program, you need people agile and hmm. thinking about how to solve problems, right? So this is really a key component. Then of course you need access to data, hmm. And you need a number of infrastructure for computing purposes. But let's say from the point of view of our costly, hmm. the kind of infrastructure part is, the balance is relatively cheap compared to what we have seen in the past hmm. years. So the potential is huge. And it's huge also in terms of applications. That is, think about what AI can do in order to optimize the use of electricity. So we all know that the production of electricity is a problem hmm. and that, for instance, um, uh, green technologies, sometimes like the solar, have an issue because by the time you produce them, it's very difficult to store the energy and then to put it in the system in a way that is optimal. So this is something that computational and learning ability inside AI can help a lot doing. So there is all this potential there. Yeah. The threats are huge in the sense that we have to... Ha so it is very good to trust the technology, but we have to do it on the basis of the knowledge of what the technology does yeah. and what it should not do. So the ethical awareness is something that we still need to instill in everybody. I mean, this is about India, but this is about the rest of the world. Yeah. Because otherwise, what the risk is, is that people become adverse to the technology itself. Yeah. So, and they don't want to use it also for the good uses. So you start throwing the, the baby with the bathwater. AI can solve a number of problems. Imagine what it can do, for instance, for telemedicine in places that are very remote and where you don't have specialists. So if you are allowed to put the right in, inputs at the right time and people just do very simple things, they can be checked by the best specialists worldwide for something that they would not be able before. Yeah. However, they should know which kind of data to give. They should know that their information yeah. is used for some purposes and they should be able to have a say and feel comfortable because trust in the digital environment is fundamental. And this is why the recommendation has entire chapters about, for instance, the security, about the data. And what I, we, UNESCO is very proud about is that, yes, this is about artificial intelligence. But as a matter of fact, the implementation of the recommendation has important positive cascade effect of all the digital world. Because by the time you sort out the issue about the data, hmm. it's data for AI, but it's data for the rest of the digital uses. So if they are non-discriminatory, if you ask whomever develops AI algorithms hmm. to make sure that the data are representative of the population, that the data are not discriminating, by the time you're using those data for other purposes, you will have this beneficial effect hmm. as well. So it informs in a certain way a much broader scope. So I've seen, for instance, we were just in Hyderabad for the G20 Digital Economy Working Group, where UNESCO is knowledge partner for what pertains the aspect of digital skilling. And I could see, for instance, the use in uh, agriculture. I mean, for a country like India, this is a no-brainer. It's a fantastic development because not only you can optimize, for instance, mm. the use of water, 
but you can better know and inform. And what I think is the particularly very, very smart use that India is doing is to make it easily available and useful by many through, for instance, apps on its phone. So you don't have to know how to code. It doesn't really mm-hmm. matter. You have nevertheless to have a certain digital awareness and ability. But then you'll be told like what you can do when you're going to take the crops, what you can do next. Is it worth, you know, putting more water or not? Or checking about the species, whether they are repopulating the environment. What is the human, let's say, animal interaction, whether there are dangers. So everybody can benefit. But of course, then there are issues related to how ethically you use the data, who has the access to the data, what can be done with those data, and how to ensure that, let's say, the ecosystem of AI is responsible, ethical, and actually serves the purpose of the people. Uh, Maria, I would like to close uh, today's uh, session with you telling us about how UNESCO can help, especially India, in its efforts uh, to develop AI, to implement AI, and ethical considerations at the core. So I think India can help UNESCO, UNESCO can help India in the sense of setting the world stage for AI, that is. You have a number of developments here and the scale of the country is huge. So I mean, uh, by the time India does something, the rest of the world cannot but look and, you know, do and learn together. Hmm. So what I think for India is fundamental at this point and the way UNESCO can help India is really to implement the recommendation on the ethics of, on the ethics of AI. We have actually been working now for more than a year with worldwide experts in order to develop two tools. Because I mean, it's about the principle, but it's about to translate that into reality and being enforceable. Because otherwise we can talk many things, we say many nice things, but then if this cannot translate into the real world, the the scope of the action is limited. So we have developed a methodology which is called um, the readiness assessment methodology, which is nothing more than supporting countries in checking the kind of um, regulation infrastructure, uh, entity infrastructure, the kind of provisions they may have or they might not have in relation to the different chapters of the recommendation. The idea being to leverage on what already exists and mm-hmm. that aligns with the principles and the, the goals and help countries build the rest that is missing, right? Mm-hmm. Then we are also developing, we are actually finalizing at the moment, another tool which is called the ethical impact assessment. That is, we know the uh, AI has been developed already, is being developed, is being applied. So you can't stop there. We saw there was a call by a number of uh, eminent uh, people around the world for a moratorium. But actually the position of UNESCO is, yeah, it is important to have a discussion on the ethics, but that discussion on the ethics has happened. The principles are there. The values are there. The areas to act are there. So actually, if anything, instead of stop, let's implement and fast Hmm. the recommendation and the prescription in India, as well as around the world, because then we create a level in the playing field where AI is everywhere developed, deployed, and used in an ethical fashion. And this is also why we are we developed, as I was saying, this ethical impact assessment. The idea being that whatever the stage of development, you need to check what comes out. Hmm. It's not sufficient to say, example, I've checked that you know the data are consistent, that I'm not discriminating when I program, that is sufficient, that I'm not consuming too much energy. Fine. What comes out of the funnel? How is this impacting on your life or my life as a person? Hmm. So we are <coughs> proposing a tool to start with for the governments that would allow them to have a check and ask to repair and fix by the time it is not compliant or stop in case it is non compliant because it's harming someone. someone. Hmm. So that's exactly the idea. And this is why UNESCO is very eager to collaborate with India because of the scale and the scope of the things you're doing. And let's face it, UNESCO has as one of the priority, the youth. Mm. The youth are the future. I mean, at times we find it a bit paradoxical to some extent that discussions about the future take place only among the old that are supposed to be the wise, but then you have to empower and include the new generations because if there is anything that needs to be done in the long term, Mm. it is to be done with the youth. They are going to be the one that will do it or will not do it because they don't believe in it. And they are going to be the one that will inherit this world. So we have this focus on the youth and India, of course, as a huge part of the population that is young and this promises, is, is, can find solutions that are very original. So this is one of the beauty of the young population. They have very original um, uh, propositions. They are very innovative. 
Thank you so much, Maria. With that Thank note, you. we come to the end of today's session. Hope you found it informative. Thank you. Thank you.